Hey guys, it's Chris and welcome back to another Writing Wednesday. And today I want to talk about one of my favorite aspects of writing and that is foreshadowing. So let's talk about foreshadowing, what it is and why it's important. And then we'll talk about five or six types of foreshadowing and of course using some good examples that you may already be familiar with. So let's jump in and talk about it. How to write foreshadowing. <laughs> And before we get started, this video is brought to you by my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. Thank you guys so much for the continued support. You guys keep this channel going. And if you're new here, my name is Chris and I'm working on my fantasy debut novel, The Crimson Gods. And if you are interested in joining our Patreon community, those links will be in the description below. And if you're interested, you can also become a beta reader and I still need those. So let's talk about a foreshadowing. Again, this is one of my favorite things about writing. And then in the revision process, you're always going back and adding a few things, but I love inserting little foreshadowing hints and clues and subtle things and sometimes direct things. So let's get into it. What is foreshadowing? Essentially foreshadowing is just a literary device that writers use to kind of indicate or hint at things to come later. Now that could be just a major plot point down the road. That could be at the end of the same chapter or it could be the end of the whole damn story. These are essentially hints to all the answers to all the questions that you pose for the reader that you promise to answer later. Foreshadowing can be subtle things like storm clouds rolling up indicating dark times for the MC or can be more kind of in your face and direct. Now what I think is a great example of direct foreshadowing is Romeo and Juliet. You're talking about Shakespeare himself essentially telling you what's going to happen when he had Romeo and Juliet talking about how they didn't want to live unless they could live together. So he straight up told us this is going to be a fucking tragedy. And of course with foreshadowing, the other side of that coin is sometimes authors use false clues as well to mislead readers. These of course are called red herrings, but we'll talk about those in another video. So why is foreshadowing important? Foreshadowing essentially adds dramatic tension to a story by building anticipation about what might happen next. Authors use foreshadowing to create suspense or to convey some type of information to help the reader understand what may happen at a later point in the story. And for me personally, I think the key is the anticipation because this builds all the tension around all those nagging questions that you as the author presented to the reader that you promised would be answered later. And as we mentioned earlier, we have two types. We have direct and indirect, and I'll give examples for both, but essentially direct is when an answer to something that's going to happen is directly hinted at. So it gives the readers a piece of information which prompts them to want more. And when a reader reads this information, they're likely to know this is in fact a hint. Then of course you have indirect, which is of course is a little more subtle, which is when an outcome is kind of indirectly or more subtly hinted at, like a little subtle nod to a future event. But these are typically only apparent to the reader after they've already found out what's going to happen. So in other words, these are these little aha moments when you go back and think, damn, I knew this the whole time. This is why this person said this or whatever. So you know those moments when you're watching a movie or reading a book and you go, oh damn, it was right there the whole fucking time. So for a couple of pretty famous examples of direct and indirect foreshadowing, for direct foreshadowing, let's go to Game of Thrones and the words of House Stark, winter is coming. We hear this all the time throughout Game of Thrones and the books as well. And I think we all knew it meant something, but of course at the time we weren't sure exactly what it meant. Did he mean an actual harsh winter was coming because they did play up the idea of these long winters or did it mean a race of demon ice zombies was coming back to terrorize the world? Or another good example of this in Game of Thrones would be Ramsey Bolton when he says, if you think this has a happy ending, you haven't been paying attention. A great indirect example would be from Star Wars. Think back to episode two, Attack of the Clones, when Obi-Wan Kenobi said, why do I get the feeling you will be the death of me? And he said this to Anakin Skywalker, who of course ends up killing Obi-Wan Kenobi in episode four, A New Hope. Now I'll give a couple of examples here from The Crimson Gods, my upcoming fantasy novel. And I do have that video available on YouTube if you're interested in checking out the prologue. Now it's not the final version, there will be changes, but I do have this up on YouTube. So go watch that video and you'll get these because I won't spoil them here. But if you wanna check out that chapter, the link will be in the description below. Merrick finally removed his chest piece and untied the matching bracers. His forearms were blistered and raw where the edges of the leather had bitten into his skin through his undershirt. He decided to leave it on as the cold started to surround him. Now, of course, you won't get that right here, but go check out that video and that will make a hell of a lot more sense. And one more I'll put in here, but I won't really say much again due to spoilers. This is a little bit of foreshadowing for the bigger story at large. So I'll leave you with this. You are welcome to share my fire, Ivan, offered Merrick. I only have salt beef for supper though. A bow and a well-placed arrow would have saved the day. So just a couple examples from the Crimson Gods and one you will completely understand when you watch that video on the prologue. 
So anyway, how do we write foreshadowing? Here are six different types of foreshadowing with more examples. Number one, we have the pre-scene. Now, a pre-scene is essentially just a smaller scene set on a much smaller scale that kind of tells you what's going to happen later in a bigger plot point or the bigger story itself. So essentially a smaller scene that mimics the bigger picture on a much smaller scale. A great example of this would be Stranger Things season one. If you watch this show, you know that in the very beginning of season one, the kids were playing Dungeons and Dragons against a mystical creature called the Demigorgon. Then of course the rest of season one and two and three for that matter, they were fighting a mystical creature in real life that they called the Demigorgon. So in that one little scene, it kind of encapsulated the entire story on a much smaller scale. Number two, the irregular descriptions. This is essentially where an author describes something, perhaps the look of someone, but they give a lot more detail to one little aspect of their description that they do the rest of them. So it kind of sets it apart and kind of clues the reader in that this is going to be a big deal. A good example of this would be from Game of Thrones or Song of Ice and Fire. You have one of my favorite characters, the Hound, and the scar or burns on his face. He had lowered the visor on his helm. It was fashioned in the likeness of a snarling black hound, fearsome to behold, but Tyrion had always thought it was a great improvement over Clegane's hideously burned face. Now that's just one example from a Tyrion chapter in A Game of Thrones, but that's brought up over and over again in all these early hound scenes about the scar on his face, the look of him, how it scares people, etc. And of course, later on, we would find out why he got those burns. It was from his brother. Then we find out he's afraid of fire. So he has this kind of whole fire theme along with his character arc. And of course, in the show at least, and I think he will in the books as well, he will eventually learn to kind of embrace the fire and defeat his brother using it. And number three, a term you've likely heard before, whether you're an author or not, Chekhov's gun. Now, this is famously named after Pavlovich Chekhov, an author who famously quoted, if in act one you have a gun on the wall, then it must fire in the last act. So this is typically an object, but could be anything that comes back in the story. Now Chekhov's guns are really important because it creates those satisfying payoffs in resolving conflicts as opposed to something from left field that the reader doesn't understand, such as some unexplained magic system or technology. Another good example from Game of Thrones, Arya has her dire wolf Nymeria. Now early on, Arya has to run off Nymeria to save her life, but then we see in the books at least that we hear about this big giant wolf pack being seen running around the Riverlands. Now the show kind of failed at this, although we did see Nymeria in the wolf pack again, but I think in the books, this is going to be a much bigger deal. And George R. R. Martin himself said this, you know, I don't like to give things away, but you don't hang a giant wolf pack on the wall unless you intend to use it. So there you go, directly referencing a Chekhov's gun. Or a Chekhov's gun could be something simple as a car in the background of a scene, and later on, that very same car, or a car like it, is used as a getaway car. Or maybe your MC is kidnapped and thrown in the trunk of that very same car that we saw earlier in the story. And number four, symbolism. Now typically these are objects that the author uses to represent future events. Now of course there's two types here as well, external and internal, where external may be a little more in your face and internal may be a little more subtle. I think a perfect example of this is going back to Game of Thrones. We have the scene from the first book or the first chapter where Bran and Ned Stark and all the crew come across the dead stag and the dead dire wolf. Now of course the stag represents House Baratheon, their sigils being a stag itself, and the dire wolf itself is the sigil of House Stark. They're both dead, they killed each other. So essentially this represents what's going to happen to their families, all the turmoil that's going to come up in the story and eventually lead to basically almost the extinction of both houses. And number five, prophecy. Now these can also be foretellings or dreams or whatever, but essentially with a prophecy, you're kind of overtly telling the readers what's going to happen. But these of course can be literal, metaphorical, or they can be complete bullshit. I think another great example of this is a Song of Ice and Fire or Game of Thrones, where we have the prince that was promised prophecy. This is the big one. Who is the person that's going to wake dragons from stone? Who is the savior that's going to pull forth this flaming sword called Lightbringer? Or is it all bullshit? In A Song of Ice and Fire, the prophecy fits multiple characters in different ways. It fits Danny in some literal ways, where she literally birthed dragons from stone from the petrified dragon eggs. And it fits John in a more metaphorical way, where I think a flaming sword just represents Valyrian steel. And of course, he received the Valyrian steel sword called Longclaw. 
Now on the show, of course, John didn't actually defeat the Night King. It ended up being Arya's dagger that was also Valyrian steel. So I think in that case, the flaming red sword would just represent Valyrian steel itself that we as readers or show watchers already know seems to be special in some way. Either way, it keeps us, the reader, on the edge of our proverbial seats trying to figure out who the hell this savior is. And number six, we have simple phraseology. By far one of my favorite forms of foreshadowing, I'm really enjoying going back through the editing process and kind of tweaking all this stuff and kind of giving out clues and hints as to what's going to happen. For another Game of Thrones example or A Song of Ice and Fire, we have Catelyn Stark saying this, Sometimes she felt as if her heart had turned to stone. And of course, spoiler warning, Catelyn Stark later on becomes Lady Stoneheart. And of course, a very big plot point in Game of Thrones would be Hodor. If you watch the show especially, you know what the hell this means. Hodor. Hodor agreed happily. He ducked to get his great shaggy head under the door. Hodor is nearly seven feet tall. It was hard to believe that he was the same blood as old Nan. And another one. The door opened with a bang, and Bran's heart leapt into his mouth in sudden fear, but it was only Maester Lewin with Hodor looming in the stairway behind him. So of course, every time Hodor is mentioned early on, there's some kind of talk of a damn door. And of course, later on in the show, we discovered that Hodor means hold the door. So Bran had went back into the past, but he warged Hodor from the present trying to save his own life. This got all the wires mixed up. Hodor back in the past saw present Bran. He had kind of a seizure-like episode and started screaming, hold the door. They ended up being shortened down to Hodor. So that was a big oh shit moment. And now we can go back in the books and see all these little references to doors all over the damn place. So I really, really love this kind of foreshadowing. It's really fun to kind of, you know, put these out there and then have all these little aha moments when you get to the point of the reveal of this particular piece of foreshadowing or the reveal of the whole damn story. We go, damn, it was right there the whole fucking time. And you can click right over here for the Crimson Gods playlist as I talked about the prologue and all that stuff as well. And you can click right over here for more writing tips and tricks. And if you dig what I do here, please give these videos a like, comment, and a share. And of course, be sure to subscribe to get everything and click that notification bell twice so you're notified when I drop a new video. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.